Good afternoon and welcome to uh, Asthma Grand Rounds. I'm Chris Fanta. It's my pleasure to welcome you and wish you a happy spring. And uh, to introduce a very special speaker today, Dr. Adnan Majid from uh, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, where he is Chief of uh, Interventional Pulmonology. I should say Beth Israel Leahy Health, I guess, is what I meant to say. Right, right, right. And uh, we're, we're delighted to have you here to talk to us. I just have one brief uh, announcement for those who are joining us by live webcasting. We do welcome your uh, questions. You can text them to the phone number shown there, 617-513-6043, and we'll address them to Dr. Majid at the end of his talk. And if you're interested in CME credit, all those in the audience can sign at the entranceway. And uh, those who are attending by live webcasting can just send an email to the CFANT at partners.org and we'll uh, make sure that Harvard grants you your CME credit. So we wanted to talk about a, a disease or a, a condition that can mimic asthma uh, and yet is very distinct in how do we manage it. And someone who has really helped to define the field, it's our understanding about tracheomalacia is Dr. Adnan Majid. So we're delighted to have you here to talk to us about tracheobronchomalacia in the adult. Well, Dr. Fanta, thank you for the invitation. It's a real honor and pleasure to be here. And again, yeah, we're going to talk about a disease entity that still in 2019 is under-recognized and sometimes is misdiagnosed by more common or more prevalent diseases such as asthma and COPD. Hopefully by the end of my talk, I can give you some pearls on how to approach these patients, how to uh, work them up, and ultimately how to treat them. I do have some disclosures. I'm, I'm an educational consultant for multiple companies and I'm the principal investigator for multiple studies that are industry sponsored, but I do not have any conflicts of interest with regards to this presentation. So let's start with a case. <clears throat> Typical case, 54 year old female with recurrent respiratory infections, shortness of breath, inability to clear secretions and cough. Initially diagnosed with asthma, and initially, uh, 20 years ago, and initially she responded to bronchodilators and inhaled corticosteroids for a couple of years. After that, uh, therapy was maximized, but unfortunately she remains severely symptomatic. As <clears throat> um, she underwent a chest x-ray, which was unrevealing, lung function testing, with pre and post bronchodilator, which are normal as you may see, full volume loop, uh, <clears throat> again, unremarkable. So that takes us to an interactive question. And since we don't have the system, I'll ask people to raise their hands. Uh, what would be the next best step in the diagnosis of, of this patient? Perform a rigid bronchoscopy. No one takes that one. Perform a dynamic flexible bronchoscopy. We have some that will go that route. Perform a dynamic airway CT. We have a few more hands. For perform a metacoline challenge. We have a few of those as well. And perform a flexible laryngoscopy. We don't have anyone for that one. Well, <clears throat> although it can be debatable in real life, we will do multiple of those. The next best step will be a dynamic airway CT, and we'll explain why as we go through our lecture today. So we did a dynamic airway CT, and not surprisingly, we do see a near complete collapse with forced exhalation compatible with tracheobronchomalacia. So what are our current challenges in 2019 when we're dealing with patients with tracheobronchomalacia? First, again, remains underdiagnosed or misdiagnosed. We don't have a, de a standardized definition or classification that we can talk among each other. It's a heterogeneous disease with diverse symptom profiles. Some patients are, despite having severe collapse, they are asymptomatic. Others will present with dyspnea, others with cough, others with recurrent infections, others with all of the above. If untreated, 
it does carry significant morbidity, quality of life limitations, and significant health care utilization. Proposed treatments are invasive, and data to support those treatments are uncontrolled. So there is significant bias to this data. So throughout the next uh, 50 minutes, let's, uh, I plan to talk to you about the definition and classification and some clinical evidence supporting the use of airway stents, airway surgery, medical therapy, and final thoughts on recommendations. So first, the definition. <clears throat> Excessive central airway collapse includes both tracheobronchomalacia and excessive dynamic airway collapse. And what's the difference between these two? So tracheobronchomalacia is characterized by softening of the cartilaginous wall of the airway with subsequent collapse upon exhalation. On the other hand, excessive dynamic airway collapse, the, the cartilaginous wall is preserved, but there is excessive um, um, intrusion of the posterior wall into the airway with exhalation and subsequent obstruction. Although from a pathophysiology standpoint, they are significantly different, their clinical manifestations, the diagnostic workup, and their treatment is very similar, as you will see in the rest of my lecture. So we don't make a, a clear distinction between both entities in clinical practice. Uh, how can we classify this uh, entity? There are multiple classifications. It can be classified according to the etiology, the morphology, the severity, and some have uh, decided to lump all these classifications together. So if we go through it uh, by etiology, it's classified into primary and secondary. Primary, most of the times we see it in the pediatric population or in the idiopathic form or munir kuhn syndrome, the adults. Most commonly in adults, we see that t tracheobronchomalacia is acquired and secondary. It can be acquired secondary to trauma, most of the times after lung surgery, lung transplantation being one of them, tracheal resection and reconstruction. Patients with chronic infections, patients with cystic fibrosis <coughs> can have a significant tracheomalacia as well. Pa uh, we see tracheomalacia in patients who have chronic inflammatory conditions, asthma, COPD, relapsing polychondritis. And we can also see it in patients who have chronic extrinsic compression. This type of malaysia, the last one, is more of a focal malaysia in patients with uh, goiters. It can be also classified according to the severity. Historically, uh, it was said that if there was a decrease of 50%, of more than 50% in the cross-sectional area of the central airways upon exhalation, you had tracheomalacia. Recently, a study from our group at Beth Israel from the radiology group showed that if we use that as a definition, 78% of normal of healthy volunteers will be labeled as having tracheomalacia. For that reason, the threshold has increased and based on expert opinion, right now we we, we take 70 as normal, 70 to 80 uh, percent, mild, 81 to 90, um, moderate and severe greater than 90. And we're, when we're talking about this, a decrease in the cross-sectional area greater than 90 percent. From a clinical perspective, we need to identify those that have severe disease because those are the ones that we're going to intervene. The other ones, will, we don't do interventions for them. You can also classify the disease according to the morphology. As we know, it is, it's normal to have certain degree of collapse with exhalation. And again, as we said before, le less than 70% is normal. If we have greater than 70% uh, <clears throat> decrease in the cross-sectional area or decrease in the AP diameter, which co both correlate, and we preserve the C-shaped configuration of the airway, we call that excessive dynamic airway collapse. If we have a decrease in the AP diameter, but also we have loss of that C-shaped configuration of the airway, we have the crescentic tracheobronchomalacia that you can see here 
in certain patient populations, like the COPD population, instead of seeing a decrease in the AP diameter, we see a decrease in the lateral diameter. We call that a saber sheath type of tracheomalacia. And finally, in patients with a relapsing polychondritis, we see a decrease in the AP diameter and we see a decrease as well as a decrease in the lateral diameter. That's the circumferential type. And for treatment, <clears throat> for a, uh, from a treatment perspective, these two are approached the same way, these two are approached differently, and we briefly touch bases on that. Some have tried to put all this information together, coming with the FEMUS classification, will include the functional class, the etiology, the morphology, the origin, the severity, to make it a more complex classification. But unfortunately, it's very cumbersome to, to, to do, uh, to implement in clinical practice and does not have any pro prognostic, uh, uh, does not help you with prognosis or with treatment. So it's not very used. So uh, from a clinical perspective, again, as I said before, it is, uh, <clears throat> these patients present sometimes uh, with, they are asymptomatic. You will be surprised. Some patients do have significant collapse and they don't experience any symptoms. But most will present with some degree of dyspnea. Dyspnea can be severe enough to cause respiratory failure, cough, Again, it's a cough that is typical, is described as a barking seal, usually it's incapacitating and can lead to a cough into syncope. Uh, these patients have a, the inability to clear secretions, leading to mucostasis and recurrent respiratory infections. And a, a small percentage of patients will have an unexplained extubation failure, especially if they go for an elective procedure, they are intubated, and upon extubation, they have complete collapse of their with respiratory failure and they have to be intubated again. So the differential diagnosis, as you can imagine, these symptoms are not specific and would include more prevalent conditions that we see on a daily basis, like chronic bronchitis, emphysema, asthma, bronchiectasis and chronic cough. And many times, again, these are, uh, the, the condition is misdiagnosed if you don't have a, <clears throat> uh, if you don't think about it. So how do we approach the diagnosis? If we are thinking about this condition, we have two tools. We have the dynamic airway CT and a dynamic flexible bronchoscopy that remains to be the gold standard in the, diagnostic, the diagnosis of this condition. So how do we do a dynamic airway CT? We usually, a multi-detector CT, no contrast with a thin cuts, usually 1.25 millimeter cuts. We ask the patients to take a deep breath in and at end inhalation, we, we take an image. And then with forced exhalation, we take another image. Studies have shown that if you take that image at end exhalation, you may miss some of the cases. It underestimates the degree of collapse. And sometimes when we are looking at the CAT scans, we ne need to make sure we look, click into the inspiratory uh, images, and that's straightforward. But when we're looking at the expiratory images, even if we click and it says expiratory, we want to make sure that that uh, picture was taken at the right time. And how can we uh, <coughs> cor corroborate that? Well, we have to look, we have to see some degree of uh, bulging of the posterior membrane. We have to see some degree of a decrease in the AP diameter, and we should see some degree of air trapping. If we don't see any of that, if, we, if, the, if the CAT scan says expiratory uh, images, but the posterior wall, uh, posterior wall is bulging outward, that means the picture was not taken at the right time, and you, be, you need to be suspicious that probably you are not getting the full story. In that case, either you repeat the CAT scan, or you proceed with the gold standard, which is a dynamic flexible bronchoscopy. So once you've done the, the, the CAT scan, you do measure the cross-sectional area uh, uh, at end inspiration, you measure the cross-sectional area at end exhalation, and then you calculate the collapsibility index. And if your collapsibility index is greater than 70%, you made the diagnosis. But again, in those cases where you are still suspicious of having tracheomalacia or excessive collapse of the central airways, but your CAT scan is not revealing, then you have to 
proceed with the gold standard, which is the dynamic flexible bronchoscopy. The dynamic flexible bronchoscopy not only gives you, uh, it allows you to assess the severity of the collapse, assess the extent of the collapse, but also allows you to evaluate for coexisting conditions, like acid reflux disease, vocal cord dysfunction. It also allows you to get microbiologic analysis of uh, sputum, and in some cases it will help you do some pulmonary toilet in patients with significant secretions. How do we do a dynamic flexible bronchoscopy? Usually is done um, under light sedation with a low dose uh, midazolam, low dose fentanyl, and topical anesthesia. 1% lidocaine, around 30 to 40 mLs. Um, and we use a um, diagnostic scope. We prefer to use in the hybrid scope, which has a 4.2 outer diameter with a 2.0 ch working channel to prevent stenting of the airways by a therapeutic scope. And we ask the patient to follow some instructions. We introduce the uh, bronchoscope to the proximal trachea, usually at the level of the cricoid. We ask them to take a deep breath. We take an image, then we ask them to blow it out. We take an image uh, with forced exhalation almost at the end of the exhalation. And we repeat this maneuver in the proximal trachea, mid trachea, distal trachea, right main, BI, left main proximal, left main distal. We do some uh, measurements. Uh, we, again, uh, can measure the cross-sectional area, or with time, uh, we just, on an eyeball, you can identify this, and you know who has severe disease and who doesn't. So how good is the CAT scan compared to the flexible bronchoscopy? We, we did a study at Beth Israel, a very small study published in CHESS almost 12 years ago, 29 patients, and we compared the gold standard and the dynamic airway CT as per protocol, and CT was, was able to depict a, a Malaysia in 97% of the cases. So it's very good, but having said that you need to, to remember what, what you read in the literature is mo most of the times comes from center of excellence that are invested in these programs. In the community, this may not be the case, and then you have to, if, if your CAT scan does not show you the collapse, then you have to question, is this a, a, a false negative result and pursue with the gold standard, which is the dynamic flexible bronchoscopy. So just to change gears, uh, another uh, a point that I want to highlight is the role of pulmonary function test in the evaluation of these patients. As you know, if a patient comes with these symptoms, cough, shortness of breath to a pulmonary clinic, they get an x-ray and they get a pulmonary function test. And the uh, pulmonary function test, although they can support the diagnosis and identify coexisting conditions, they are not sensitive nor specific to depict airway malaise. We do, did look at this uh, now uh, five years ago we got 90 patients uh, with moderate to severe tracheobronchomalacia, and we looked at their PFTs. Uh, and as you may see, <clears throat> the PFT pattern, 44% had obstructive ventilatory defect, 18 had restricted defect, 17 had mixed, but most importantly, 21 of them had normal PFTs, patients with near complete collapse of their central airways and, symptomatic, and symptoms had uh, normal PFTs. So the, the, the the uh, take home point is if you have a patient with symptoms, normal PFTs, you, that doesn't mean they don't have the disease. You need to still keep working and try to make the diagnosis. From a, the flow volume loop, uh, again, the most frequent finding is a low FEF uh, max. Uh, we did see a, a bif basic uh, shape of the flow volume loop, which is very similar to what we see with patients with severe obstructive lung disease uh, in 20%. In 9% 90, in we saw this notch uh, in the expiratory limb, and in 3% we saw uh, flow oscillations in the expiratory limb. Please remember that these flow oscillations, you can see it with other diseases, functional diseases of the larynx, as well as obstructive sleep apnea. And again, in almost 20%, the flow volume loop was completely normal. So a normal flow volume loop, normal uh, uh, PFT pattern sh should not uh, dissuade you from the diagnosis of tracheobronchomalacia. So now that we've made the diagnosis of TBM, how should we approach these patients? As I said before, many patients are asymptomatic. 
So in those cases, we don't need to move to the next step and we don't need to treat them. But we do recommend a close follow-up and a limited workup. Question yourself, why do they have this excessive collapse of the airway? Look for coexisting conditions that may predispose them to develop this excessive collapse of the central airways and try to identify these coexisting conditions, treat them, and try to prevent disease progression. If they are symptomatic, patients that have severe collapse and they are symptomatic, then look for coexisting conditions and, if, uh, <clears throat> and treat them and reassess them clinically in four to eight weeks. If their symptoms persist despite maximal medical therapy of coexisting conditions, you should take these patients and consider them, consider them for a stent trial. And what's a stent trial? Basically, what we try to, with a stent trial, we try to identify those patients uh, that would benefit from a surgical correction of their problem. This uh, stent trial, uh, uh, we can perform it in a minimal invasive way through a rigid bronchoscopy and placing stents in the areas where we see this collapse. Um, um, our experience has shown that from 100 patients that have severe a, a central collapse and they are symptomatic who undergo a stent trial, only 75% will report improvement. There is a 25% that will not report improvement. So it's important to do this, this, um, this stent trial because if we jumped from, uh, from making the diagnosis to surgery, we'll be, we'll be offering surgery to 25% of patients that may not benefit from this invasive intervention. So, but we took this one step ahead. We said, well, can, now that we have a, a, a significant experience with this patient population and many patients have undergone a stent trial, can we, um, are we able to predict who will do well with a stent? And we, we <clears throat> looked uh, at our um, database and we took all patients with severe uh, central airway collapse, again, including EDAC and TBM that had undergone a stent trial with metallic and cover stents. And we divided this into two groups. One group that of 25 patients, group one, were the ones who had a positive stent trial. That means that the patients improved with the stent. And the group two included 19 patients, and these were patients that had a stent and did not experience any improvement, subjective and objective improvement. We, ana we looked at the uh, different variables, demographic, co comorbidities, symptoms, and some baseline measurements. And we looked at their baseline characteristics in both groups. We looked at the BMI, age, sex, Coexisting conditions like sarcoid, asthma, GERD, COPD, S uh, presenting symptoms, shortness of breath, cough, uh, inability to clear secretions and recurrent infections, extent of disease, those who have tracheomalacia, those who have bronchomalacia, those who have tracheobronchomalacia. And we looked at our baseline measurements that we do as part of our clinical practice to assess the, uh, the symptoms, we use the um, MMRC for dyspnea, we use the St. George uh, um, Respiratory Questionnaire for quality of life, we use the cough quality of life questionnaire, we do a spirometry a looking at the, their lung function, and we do a six minute walk test to assess for their exercise capacity. Both groups did not show any difference. There was no difference among those groups. And then we looked, uh, we did a univariate regression analysis to some of the variables, and we could not identify any, uh, that any of these variables was predictive of success. So we concluded that in patients with severe and symptomatic ECAC, baseline characteristics and measurements fail to predict which patients will benefit from a stent trial. Thus, to date, short-term airway stabilization with airway stents is the only method available to help determine if the patient will benefit from surgical correction. So that 
let me tell you a bit about what have we seen with uh, uh, how effective are stents in this patient population. We've started to study this uh, now 12 years ago with looking at, at silicon stents in patients with severe and symptomatic tracheobronchomalacia. And our goal was to uh, assess how effective these stents were in this patient population, looking at symptoms, health-related quality of life, lung function, and exercise capacity. We ran a battery of tests at baseline, and then patients underwent a bronchoscopy and stent placement. And during that period of time, while the patient had the stent, we repeated the, the, those assessments. We got 58 patients with severe disease that underwent rigid bronchoscopy and stent placement. Mean age was 69. Most of them were men. Uh, almost 80% of patients had obstructive lung disease. Most patients presented with dyspnea followed by cough and recurrent infections. After stent placement, 77% of patients reported subjectively symptomatic improvement. How about our outcome measures? How did they do? So again, as I said before, we do you, for quality of life, we use the St. George. For, to assess Disney in this particular study, we used, we used the ATS Disney score and the BDI-TDI. To assess performance status, we used the KPS. Exercise capacity, we used the six minute walk test and then lung function, we looked at the spirometry. The, after stem placement, these patients improved in their quality of life, Disney scores, performance status, and a six-minute walk distance. All these uh, parameters were clinically significant, although the six-minute walk test did not achieve a statistical significance. And we did not see any change in FEV1. Some patients improved, other patients actually got worse, and other patients remained the same. So hard to tell. What we did see is that many patients undergoing stenting had significant complications or a significant number of complications. 90% of the complications were stent related. These complications included obstruction due to mucus plugging, infection, migration breakage, and cough. So what did we conclude? That airway stabilization with stents improve respiratory symptoms, quality of life, and functional status, but data stents are associated with a significant number of reversible complications. So after this study, we said, well, can, how can we reduce the number of complications from stenting? So we decided, we went, how can we decrease the number of my, uh, stents that migrate? So we said, well, we'll ch let's change, let's use Y-shaped silicon stents instead of tubular stents. With that, you can abolish any risk of migration. How can we decrease obstruction, mucus plugging, and infection? Well, let's uh, start all these patients on a combination of a mucolytic and an expectorant. And we... <coughs> Uh, analyzed 141 patients, 98 patients were treated under a standardized protocol and compared with 43 patients that were uh, not. And we did see a significant decrease in complications. But still, it, although we managed to decrease the complication, there, there is still 10% of patients that experience complications. So we took this to the next level and said, shall we change the type of stent? We should probably consider a stent that preserves mucociliary function. And uh, so that um, motivated us to use uncovered self-expanding metallic stents. At the time of this study, this created a lot of controversy among the IP community because as you, uh, as you know, uh, metallic stents are uh, contraindicated in benign disease. So, but we said for, uh, they're contraindicated in benign disease for a long period of time, or a long period of time, not for a, a period of one or two weeks. So we decided to move forward with this, this study where we included 33 patients, again, severe ECAC, uh, underwent uh, metallic, uncovered metallic stenting, and we did the same protocol as we had done in the previous study. We did <coughs> baseline evaluations with, um, and then we, we repeated this evaluation at seven to 14 days. <coughs> 
What did we see? Again, very similar patient characteristics. Most of these patients presented with dyspnea, cough, and recurrent infections. And after stent placement, they did improve. 88% of these patients improved in their dyspnea, 70 improved in their cough, and 57 had a improvement in their uh, mucostasis. Complications were, were decreased to 3%. 3% had infection, 3% had migration, and 3% had a pneumothorax. That re represents one patient, that 3%. So from, a, from, a, from a, an F <coughs> the clinical outcomes on these patients, again, we once again saw improvement in dyspnea, improvement in cough, and improvement in exercise capacity, and both were uh, uh, clinically and statistically significant. Once again, we did not see any change in lung function. So we concluded that short-term, and I want to highlight short-term use of uncovered self-expanding metallic airway stents is safe and improves symptoms, quality of life, and exercise capacity. So once we have identified patients that benefit from airway stabilization, the next step is to take them to surgery. Um, so what's a tracheobronchoplasty? It's a major thor thoracic surgery usually is done through a right posterior lateral thoracotomy, and the goal is to plicate the posterior membranous wall, as you may see in this cartoon, with a Marlex mesh. This Marlex mesh extends from the proximal intrathoracic uh, trachea to the distal BI to the distal left main. The lobar bronchi and the segmental bronchi are not plicated. So if they have malaysia at that level or a collapse at that level, that's not corrected. And it's important to remember that although most of the trachea is plicated, the cervical trachea is not. So uh, we, it's, a, it's a big operation. It takes about six to eight hours. Patients will stay in the hospital seven to 10 days. And after uh, their hospital stay, 50% of patients will go home, 50% will go to rehab. So a big, big ordeal. So we looked at the, at the, uh, at this, uh, how effective is this operation in this patient population now 11 years ago. We did a, a prospective observational study. And the, uh, the goal of this study was to evaluate the effect of surgical stabilization in symptoms, quality of life, functional status, lung function, and exercise capacity. We <clears throat> identified 57 patients with severe uh, diffuse tracheobronchomalacia who underwent airway stenting, and 37 reported improvement, and 35 underwent surgery. So here is another cartoon that shows that this surgery can be uh, performed in both posterior wall malaysia or anterior wall malaysia, or what we call tracheomalacia or excessive dynamic airway collapse. And this is what, again, the mesh uh, does for the posterior wall. So what did we see in this study? We saw that patients undergoing this operation, this is, these are results at three months, short-term results, improve their quality of life, they improve their dyspnea, improves the performance status, and improves the six minute walk test. And again, these values are clinically and statistically significant. And once again, we did not see changes in lung function. But this is at a price. This is a, pay, a, a procedure that has 43% morbidity. And at that time, in 2008, had a 5.7 percent mortality. In 2019, the mortality is estimated to be 1.2 percent. A subsequent report by one of my partners, Dr. Gangadaran, including more patients, now 63 patients, looked at the results. Again, once again, there was improvement in, in performance status. There was improvement in Disney scores. There was improvement in quality of life. There was improvement in six-minute walk test. Again, both clinically and significantly, clinically and statistically significant. Once again, we did not see any changes in lung function. So the big question is for how long do re these results last? Again, we, <clears throat> we have presented this in an abstract form and the, our group and our radiology group, we follow this, uh, these uh, patients, um, well now up to 10 years, but uh, 
so as you may see, uh, symptomatic improvement initially is about 80% at three months, and symptomatic improvement, uh, we saw that uh, it remains up to 65% at five years. Having said that, as you may see, the number of patients, we had a significant loss of patients. But anyway, uh, our radiology group has also recently published uh, the long-term outcomes from a radiologic standpoint. Uh, and we can see that airway patency remains uh, up to six years after surgery. Again, they also gave, gave us some, some information about the clinical outcomes, not only the radiographic outcomes, and you can see that there is still improvement in symptoms and uh, also in six-minute walk test. Many times uh, we, when <clears throat> we deal with this patient population, as I, I showed you before, uh, up to 60, 70% of these patients will have some concomitant obstructive lung disease. Uh, many believe that in, in the cases of COPD, uh, excessive central airway collapse is just extension of their disease into the central airways, and that should not be treated that these patients should just be treated the, the conventional way, way with bronchodilators, inhaled corticosteroids. Uh, we did look at this patient population a uh, few years ago and included 103 patients with COPD and moderate to severe diffuse TBN. Of note, 50% of these patients had uh, COPD goal three, goal four who underwent central airway stabilization, either by stents and or surgery. And we showed that these patients had improvement in quality of life, Disney scores, and performance status. In the surgical group, they were both clinically and statistically significant. And they, there was also a, a signs of improvement in lung function, as well as six minute walk test, but this did not reach statistical significance. So when we published this, uh, manuscript, we concluded that central airway obstruction may provide symptomatic benefit to patients with severe COPD and TBM, but, and that surgery provides the greatest advantage. We also looked at an, a, 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 at a, pa a very specific patient population, patients with munier kuhn syndrome. Again, it's an infrequent condition it are patients with tracheobronchomegaly that often is associated with excessive collapsibility of the central airways. They present <coughs> clinically very similar to the patients we've talked about, and um, the <coughs> we looked at central airway stabilization for this patient population. Uh, we published this a few years ago where we included 12 patients, and nine of these patients had airway stabilization. Eight of these patients had uh, a surgery and one had a chronic stent. And what did we find? We found that patients improved, uh, their Disney scores improved, their quality of life improved, their um, performance status improved, and actually their lung function improved as well. Having said that, we could only reach statistically significant only in the Disney score and the quality of life. And this is probably due to the sample size. Finally, is there any role for medical treatment? We reserve medical treatment for patients that are not surgical candidates. Um, and in those cases, what we do is we treat them symptomatically. What do we offer these patients uh, if they are dysnic? If their main symptom is shortness of breath, we provide them with non-invasive ventilation on as-needed basis and uh, at night. Pulmonary rehab with non-invasive ventilation to recondition them, and exercise um, breathing exercises with personally breathing maneuvers. If these patients have recurrent infections at the main symptom, we recommend uh, using a combination of an expectorant mucolytic and a mechanical device. And finally, if they have cough, they would uh, use an antitussive. And if they have all of the above, they use all of the above. Uh, but again, we reserve this to patients who are not surgical candidates. A um, few words about localized disease. Most of what I've talked about is diffuse disease. 
Uh, but in, in clinical practice, you will see that sometimes patients have localized disease and they are symptomatic as well. They could have tracheomalacia after intubation, after tracheostomy. Uh, in those patients uh, that underwent tracheobronchoplasty and the cervical part was not addressed, some of them, most of them actually, although they have some collapsibility, they do not have clinical this collapsibility has not clinical significance, but in a minority, baby will become symptomatic. And again, some of some of the, those patients that have goiters may develop focal malacia as well. How do we address these patients with focal tracheomalacia? The treatment of choice for post-intubation post tracheostomy is a tracheal resection and reconstruction. For those who have symptomatic cervical malacia, uh, the treatment of choice is a cervical tracheoplasty. And uh, for those that are not surgical candidates, then we can offer either a Montgomery tube or a, a silicone stent with an external fixation. On the other hand, for those patients that have bronchomalacia many times after a resection, either <coughs> A, a lobe resection or a, a lung transplantation, these patients may have focal malation at the level of the bronchi. Our first approach is to treat them med medically with mechanical measures, uh, but if this fails, then we consider silicone stenting uh, in the non-surgical candidate and surgery in the surgical candidate. Here are some examples of these patients. This is a patient who under, undergone it, um, tracheobronchoplasty, and that uh, five years later develops symptoms due to a, a, a residual cervical malacia. At that point, the patient was not considered a cervical candidate due to severe coronary disease and a heart failure, and underwent chronic stenting with a silicone stent with an external fixation. This is another patient who had a tracheostomy, developed a focal area of malacia, it was not considered a surgical candidate due to coexisting conditions, and they went a Montgomery T2 placement. This is another patient who had a, a, a tracheobronchoplasty, was, uh, did very well, but at five years had re focal re recurrence, and the patient did not want to repeat the surgery. Um, so we under, uh, the patient underwent a placement of a silicone stent. It's another patient that had a right upper lobectomy. He developed a right middle, a right main stem BI severe bronchomalacia with recurrent infection, as you can see here, post obstructive pneumonias, a failed medical treatment, was not a candidate for surgery, so we decided to place a silicone stent in the right main stem and BI. So, how can we wrap up? Um, the approach to this patient population. When patients are referred to us for evaluation of excessive central airway collapse, either tracheomalacia or excessive dynamic airway collapse, first we confirm the diagnosis with a dynamic CT and a dynamic flexible bronchoscopy. Once we have the diagnosis, we assess for coexisting conditions. The most frequent coexisting conditions that we deal with is patients with severe asthma, severe COPD, GERD, vocal cord dysfunction, and some degree of immunodeficiency. We treat these coexisting conditions, and if the patients remain symptomatic and have severe collapse, then at that point we consider a stent trial. If they report improvement with the stent, again, not only subjective but objective improvement, then we ask, are they surgical candidates? And if they are, we uh, uh, recommend a tracheobronchoplasty. If they are not surgical candidates, the next step is to treat them medically. We do not recommend treating them with chronic stentings. Chronic stents bring more problems than solutions. And we've seen that 40% of patients that are treated medically have a, will improve the, in their symptoms. But if this fails, then, then um, we will consider chronic airway stenting. So what's coming uh, down the pipe, and what's new, in the, and what you will be hearing in the next few years? Well, there are three new approaches to the treatment of this condition. One is laser tracheoplasty, direct tracheobronchopexy, and robotic tracheobronchoplasty. Again, 
What's laser tracheobronchoplasty? So basically the concept is to use a laser or a heat uh, modality uh, cause some inflammation of the posterior wall with sub subsequent retraction fibrosis. So there is a, a small uh, case series of, uh, done by Dr. Paul Castellanos, an ENT physician from UAB where he, do, he takes these patients into the operating room under general anesthesia, either with an endotracheal tube or suspension laryngoscopy. He applies homeon laser uh, to the collapsible airways. He goes from distal to proximal. He starts at the lower and segmental level and comes proximal and applies the laser beam in longitudinal transverse and serpentine uh, patterns. Uh, he admits these patients uh, over uh, for 40 hours, and uh, and then he follows them. Uh, in this publication, he included 10 patients with uh, severe excessive dynamic uh, airway collapse, mean age 54, usual coexisting conditions, morbid obesity, GERD, OSA, and po in this case, there were two with post-tracheostomy stenosis. Uh, he performed. Baseline evaluation, he used uh, the Disney Index questionnaire. The, um, he did so long function test, dynamic flexible bronchoscopy, and a dynamic airway CT. Uh, tracheomalacia was defined in this cohort as greater than 50%. So <coughs> he uh, observed that there was an improvement in the, in the dyspnea. Uh, and all patients reported improvement in respiratory symptoms and also there were no complications. This, again, is, sometimes it's too good to be true, more to come, but we are looking into that as well with other heat modalities to see in the animal model, to see first how safe this is, and hopefully after we, we know how safe and the dose to, of, of a, a heat to apply in the posterior memory, we can take this to the patients that are not surgical candidates and, and test it in a very rigorous manner. Another uh, <coughs> turn, uh, surgical technique that has been uh, used in the pediatric population by Dr. Jennings here at Children's Hospital is the use of posterior and anterior tracheopexy. And we are very interested in looking into this technique, especially for those patients who have circumferential malacia or, 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 or saber sheet malacia. So it, it, it consists, instead of putting a mesh in the posterior wall, what it does, basically they, it takes the, the anterior pexy, takes the anterior part of the trachea, and uh, sutures to the sternum. Uh, for the posterior pexy, they, as you may see here in this cartoon that was given by, by do, me, to me by Dr. Jennings, here you see the trachea, the esophagus, and the spine. In patients with tracheomalacia, many times you see the esophagus pushing against the floppy posterior membranous wall and obstructing the airway. So the concept is to pull out the esophagus to the side and suture the posterior wall to the anterior spinal ligament of the vertebra. And anteriorly, again, as I said before, suture the anterior wall to the sternum. So again, we are very interested in looking into this. We've done a few patients with mixed results, but especially for those patients with circumferential uh, 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 tracheomalacia, we think there could be some potential. Uh, more recently, uh, a few months ago, uh, there was a publication on robotic bronchoscopy. Again, the Da Vinci doing uh, tracheoplasty. This was uh, from a group in New York, uh, Dr. Richard Lazaro, where he took 42 patients with severe and symptomatic TBM. Most of them were women. A significant amount of patients had obstructive lung disease. And the most important uh, finding is the operative time drops by two, three hours. Again, as I said before, uh, uh, um, the conventional tracheobronchoplasty takes about six to eight hours. And in this uh, cohort, uh, it's about four hours. <coughs> Again, also there's a significant drop in the length of stay. I, in the conventional tracheobronchoplasty patient stays seven to 10 days. In this cohort, patients stayed around three days. Uh, and complications, again, similar to the conventional approach, is a 
for how effective was, was this operation. Again, in this preliminary cohort, there was improvement in lung function, there was improvement in quality of life, and there was improvement in symptoms. So again, seems promising. I think it's too early to tell, more to follow. So to finalize, um, my, I, so patients with excessive central airway collapse have no specific symptoms. That, and these this patients, usually their symptoms overlap with more prevalent conditions such as COPD and asthma, leading to a misdiagnosis and mistreatment of this condition. PFTs and flow volume loss are frequently abnormal, but their usefulness for the diagnosis of TBM is limited. Dynamic expiratory CT is highly sensitive method for detecting airway myelation. Airway stents are associated with high complication rate and should not be used chronically. Their role for airway stents in the, in the management of these patients is mainly limited to help identify those patients who benefit from surgery. And surgery remains the treatment of choice for both localized and diffuse disease. Thank you very much. Terrific. Thank you very much for a comprehensive and so clear a presentation. It's wonderful. Do you want to start, uh, Benji? I've had an overview of the presentation. Um, two questions, one therapeutic and one diagnostic. So the, the numbers that you gave for the utility of the CT, dynamic CT, those are for tracheal disease? For the, or does it also include if there's isolated bronchial I would imagine that the more distal it is, the more difficult it is to make the diagnosis. So that's the diagnostic question. And with respect to the treatment, can you speak to whether anybody has tried, particularly since the focus seems to be on the posterior membrane and there's a muscle there, on Botox uh, injections or some other contracting, uh, you know, Botox doesn't really seem like the one, uh, and um, printed, the, the role of printed uh, stents, uh, 3D printing, those Very good. So the first one, uh, how is a CT scanning for more distal disease? How effective and how sensitive it is? Uh, yes, there's some limitation, especially in the bronchus intermediates. There's some limitation, but th these numbers correspond to the trachea, right main, and, and left main. The bronchus intermediates was not looked at. And there's some limitations due to the angle. Uh, for, so for focalized disease, cats can have can have some limitations. From a therapeutic standpoint, have we looked at some local measures, injecting substances? No, to my knowledge, Botox has, has not been looked into uh, the treatment of uh, tracheobronchomalacia. We do use it actually frequently because uh, approximately 50% of our patients with tracheobronchomalacia have some degree of vocal cord dysfunction. We don't know if this is a a, a mechanism of defense, trying the, the body close to create some intrinsic PIP. But when once you stabilize the airways, you keep having vocal cord dysfunction, it becomes definitely pathologic. So some patients do respond to speech therapy, others need Botox. Um, so we, uh, to my knowledge, the, um, there's no, no injections or topical therapies um, or substances that can be injected in the posterior wall to stiffen it. Um, we are actively looking into the use of heat therapy, and we looked at lasers, different type of lasers. We looked at the KTP laser, the electrocautery, RFA, and APC in the uh, explanted lung, which uh, led us to conclude that APC in the argon plasma collation, it probably is the safest. And we had just finished a, a, um, a study in the live animal, and we're going to present at ATS. And once that's presented and we get the feedback and we'll probably start uh, implementing that therapy in focal malaysia uh, in the non-surgical candidate. Um, and the third question was the role of 3D printing and airway stents in this disease. We have looked into that because one of the problems with stenting is that by placing a stent, a stent is very stiff and uh, you, the choke point migrates and at the distal end of the stent, what happens is the, uh, the posterior wall rubs against the stent. And then you end up with another problem, which is granulation tissue formation. 
So in order to avoid that in patients that require that fail medical treatment and are not surgical candidates, what we've done and in, in partnership with stenting companies, uh, we do change. We use a CAT scan to design the stent, and then we alter the stiffness of the stent. We want the stent to be stiffer than the native airway, but we don't want the stent to be too stiff because if not, it generates that granulation tissue formation. Now we have only a, a handful of uh, patients that at least we have been able to uh, decrease the incidence of granulation tissue formation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, my question is about uh, development and oncogenesis. Trichomalacia, bronchomalacia are pretty common in pediatrics. It's hard to believe that they just sort of disappear, or do they? I mean, so is there some age-related improvement? Is there also, uh, you know, are we missing the diagnosis? Because some of the age of intervention seems pretty, pretty old to me. It's hard to believe that those who have fairly severe trichobronchomalacia at age 60 didn't have it at age 40 or 35. So can you comment on that? Excellent question. I'm not quite sure I'm the right person to talk about that and the pediatric tracheomalacia and bronchomalacia. My knowledge in, in pediatric uh, dynamic airway collapse or uh, is that this uh, patients outgrow their disease. So that's why um, um, pediatricians hesitate to do any type of intervention because most of them, laryngomalacia, tracheomalacia, bronchomalacia, uh, as the, uh, the, the kid grows, grows the, 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 their symptoms improve. Having said that, those that have severe uh, tra uh, tracheobronchomalacia in, in, and, uh, and, and um, Dr. Jennings has a great, uh, vast experience. They undergo surgery. Their surgery is different. Um, is they don't do the tracheobronchoplasty that we do in the adult population. They do either the orthopexy or they do the anterior or posterior pexis. To answer your other question, is this some immunologic process? Uh, it's hard to, uh, at this point, I don't think we have the, the knowledge on how this evolves. Uh, there's also some no, uh, theories that in the adult population, patients that have asthma, COPD, that is not only the chronic inflammation of their disease, but also the use of some of the medications, the inhaled corticosteroids may be associated with softening of the airways, atrophy of the posterior wall, and also uh, um, interference with the uh, vasculature of the airways. Um, Unfortunately, at this point, unfortunately, I don't have the answers to your questions. Yeah, I, th I think that definitely, uh, <clears throat> I, I, I think there is association with asthma and COPD, again, due to the chronic inflammation, but I do think there's also a role for the medications we give, which are, are associated with the vasculopathy. Uh, many times, uh, what we do see is, again, we do repair the, uh, surgically these patients, and they do better, but again, their underlying conditions, their asthma and COPD need to be treated. 
Can I uh, take a question that was yeah. uh, sent by text, if you don't mind? And it has to do with the question of patients with severe airway collapse, central airway collapse, and normal flow volume curve. Do we have an explanation for that? And maybe there's a corollary, which was the interesting finding that so many of the patients had relief of their dyspnea as a result of stabilization of central airways, but their lung function didn't change. And how, how to explain that? Those are the that's a great question, and we've been struggling with that question uh, for many years, and that has been a major criticism of our studies, because as you know, as pulmonologists, we like physiology, and we want to see if we see that FEV1 improves, that's a good treatment. If it doesn't, it's not a good treatment. So I think the problem is that we probably, FEV1 is not the best marker of the disease. Again, if you are seeing complete collapse and the FE1 in 20% of the K patients is normal, then I think we don't, we haven't identified the right marker. So how do they, if, if long, fun, we haven't been able to, to show that lung function improves, why do these patients improve otherwise? Because again, TBM is not only a disease of lung, of um, flow limitation. It's a disease of flow limitation and cough and recurring infections. I think if we deal with the cough, that preventing the airways co to collapse, and we improve the ability of these patients to clear secretions, we are going to decrease the number of infections, which ultimately will uh, make uh, airflow in li um, uh, limitation worse. One last question, if you could, Kathy. I, I, the, I think I see the question in two ways. <clears throat> if we stabilize the airways using stents, do we need to use uh, airway clearance maneuvers? Or uh, yes, we if we place stents in this patient population, we in order to improve their airway clearance, we do we recommend a combination of a mucolytic and expectorant and a mechanical device. Uh, for patients that do not have an airway stent, but they need to work on their airway clearance, we do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for a terrific presentation. It was great. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you.